So, a couple of slides just to remind us where we are. We're talking about practical theology, or how our theology gets put into practice. And the way I've chosen to talk about that is in terms of stewardship. Now, people don't like the word stewardship because they always think it means money. It means asking people for money, like asking you to pay for a chair or something. Uh, so, it's not. Stewardship is much bigger than just money. And the definition we've used is the conducting, supervising, or managing of something especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. As we've said, it's like being the manager, but not the owner of a business. You're still the one responsible for making sure it's run right, it's successful, etc. That's what a steward is. A steward is a manager. Um, someone who cares for something that belongs to someone else. We as Christians know that everything was made by God, everything still belongs to God, and He entrusts it to us for our use, and for us to be able to use it for the, the needs and care of other people. So that's what it means to be a steward, or stewardship in a Christian sense. And again, it's not just about money. Christian stewardship has to do with every aspect of our lives. Everything in your life is given to you by God, and you are entrusted with it to make good use of it. So everything you have, every event that happens, every choice that you make, you are called to be a good steward of that because all of those things come to you from God. Now, so we talk about in terms of whole life stewardship. That's what this class is all about. Okay? So we're good with that. You know, you know what this is all about, right? Today we want to talk about stewardship of time. And the first thing we need to do is answer the question, what is time? Now, if that sounds like a silly question, nobody really knows. Neither philosophers nor scientists are able to actually define what time is. Um, we can describe it in a sense that, you know, we would probably use as a dictionary definition, but first we need to understand that every major, well not every, but a lot of different major religions and cultures throughout history have had different understandings of what time is. The ancient Greeks, as well as some of the Far Eastern um, religious beliefs, have seen time as a cycle. It's like a merry-go-round. And it all goes around and it all comes back. Uh, this, is, this is one of the principles behind the Eastern uh, or the Asian uh, concept of Dharma, which is present in a number of different Asian religions. Dharma means, you know, what goes around comes around. It means what you do comes back to you. Well, that's part of this idea that everything is just a cycle. There have been other beliefs, particularly in the Far East, that, that time is actually meaningless. It's not real. You know, that it's all just a, a, a fantasy. So there have been different understandings of time. The Christian understanding of time is quite different from any of that. See, the modern concept of time is that it's just one darn thing after another. I mean, in other words, there's no real concept of it. A good definition, I believe, of time from our perspective. I'm not talking about you know a God perspective or anything. But from our perspective, time can be understood as the duration of our existence in this world before we enter eternity. In other words, from our birth until our deaths, the sequence of events occur in a medium which we refer to as time. And again, neither philosophers nor scientists can tell you exactly what's going on here. Why is it it only goes in one direction? Okay. And of course, there's always been the idea of time travel going back and going forward, and all of the, you know, the, the quantum physicists kind of guys are telling you that's not possible, and there's all sorts of, well, we don't know exactly what it is, but we can describe it in a way that allows us to work with it as a concept. That's the first thing we need to understand. And lest we forget, we need to, we need to be reminded, Time is, according to Scripture, something that God invented very specifically. The, the linear time, as we know it, a sequence of consecutive events of which we are, you know, we are witness to part of it. Of course, there's time occurring in some place we're not witness to. God created that. Specifically in Genesis 1, 14 to 16, it says, And God said, Let there be lights. This is day four. Of creation. Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let there be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. Now, we say that that is God's invention of time, because in the passage of time, the only way we understand the passage of time is by marking it off. Okay, the passage, the 
exactly that passage. So, one of the standard things that we have is a day. What is a day? Morning and night. Well, if you're Jewish, night and morning. <laughs> but what specific scientifically is it? 24 hours. It's a rotation of the earth. Okay? He made, you know, the the stars and the planets. He made the heavens and all the things in the heaven. And what is a year? The revolution of, uh, of the earth around the sun, one time. And everything else, in case you've never thought about it, is a fraction of that. Hours, minutes, seconds, degrees, you know, the, the, all, time breaks down into degrees as well. You know, degrees and, and, and seconds can be correlated with one another because it has to do with rotation. The rotation of the earth, the revolution of the earth around the sun. God created time in any way that we can understand it when he created the celestial bodies and put them in working order with relationship with one another. That's what creates seconds and minutes and hours and days and years, and decades and centuries, and millennia, and etc. Okay? So God very specifically made time. It is his creation. But now having, uh, having said that, we need to recognize um, that God is not subject to time in the way we are. I'll talk about that in a minute. One of the things we need to realize, too, about time is that it is the great equalizer. Everyone is allotted the same amount of time, at least while they're alive on this earth. 86,400 seconds is how much time everybody has in a day. Okay? That doesn't change for anybody. 60 times 60 times 24, okay? Um, everybody has the same amount. Now, whether you have 50 years or 60 years or 102 years, like my father-in-law, obviously there's, a, you know, there's an accumulation of that. But the bottom line is, as we experience time, as it passes for us, we all have exactly the same. Now, our culture, as you all know, and I hear it from, from people who are working two jobs as much as, it, or from people who are retired, supposedly retired, is there's never enough time. You know, there's just not enough time to get it done. Rush, 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 go, 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 gotta, 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 get it done, get it done, get it, you know, all of all this pressure. Well, the most pressured people in the world and the most laid back people in the world have exactly the same quantity of this resource, and it is a resource, which we call time. So the question isn't that there's not enough time. Everybody has the same amount of time. There's no more or less of that, at least until we die. The issue, the real questions are, how do we spend our 86,400 seconds? How do we spend it, and how do we decide how we're going to spend it? In other words, how do we get control of it in a way that's productive? Now, people say, not enough time, not enough time, too busy, too many things to do, too many appointments, too many meetings, too many calls, too many... There are all sorts of reasons we could get into as to why people allow that to happen to them. And you notice I said allow that to happen to them. A lot of it has to do with people, where people find their value, their sense of self-worth. And I've worked as a consultant, I've worked with people who can't turn their phones off. It is not psychologically possible for them to turn their phones off or not answer the phone. Um, I mean, I told the story in here, I was working with a guy, we had actually purchased his company, and, and he and I were working alongside one another with, um, Bob's here, you need to see her? He's bringing me her. Okay, good. I need to um, feed her. Okay, good. <laughs> Bananas. We'll not count on that. Um, Sorry. So I'm working with this consultant, and we're in meetings with a client for the first through the morning. It's like an all-day meeting. And his phone kept ringing, and he kept answering it. So the first break, I said, Butch, we don't answer our telephones. These people are paying us a lot of money to be here for them. You don't answer the phone for somebody else. And he said, oh. I don't know. I said, that, I'm not asking. Okay? And so <laughs> we went into the, after the break, the rest of the day. I noticed that with the table there, he's sort of leaning forward like this a lot of the time. <laughs> and I glance down, and he is texting by touch to people. Well, that relationship didn't work out for very long. We decided that he was not, he didn't, and it was because, like, he's one example, and I've known many of them psychologically they had allowed time and the events that happen in time, the busyness, the hurriedness, the urgency, they got to talk to them, you know, somebody's trying to reach me, to be the thing from which they drew their sense of self-worth. I want to talk about that in a little while. 
that they did feel like they were valuable, like they were worth something, important. That's the wrong place to find your value. Again, I'll talk about that. But in terms of, we all have the same amount of time, how do we now spend it? I want to give you some information that was done from a survey of American citizens. So if, if you're not in the U.S., you can probably feel more superior. Um, the average American in their lifetime, now this, is, this takes into account people who died at 50 and people who died at 103, okay? They will spend 70 days on average reading the Bible. Sounds like a lot, unless you're talking about an average age of maybe seven years or something. They'll spend six months sitting in traffic lights. Uh -oh. uh, wait, wait, is this, is wait. this like... Is this like... Oh, I've got them all up there, sorry. Is this for their whole lifespan? Hey, this is a lifetime. Okay. In a lifetime. An average American will spend um, 70 days reading the Bible, six months sitting at, a tra at traffic lights, eight months opening junk mail, <laughs> one year looking for something they've lost, displaced objects, obviously add all that up, Two years on the internet, some people have way more than that. <laughs> I think this is an old study. Five years waiting in lines, 5.5 years driving a car, and again, for some people, it's way more than that. Seven and a half years listening to the radio, and 10 years watching television. Other than sleeping, television watching is one of the predominant activities on which we spend our time. Okay? So how do we spend our time? And perhaps an even more fundamental question is, how do we decide how we're going to spend our time? Because time is a resource. It's as though you've been given $86,400 a day, and you have that day to spend it. How are you going to spend it? Time is very much like that. Except the only difference is, unlike money, you can't put it in the bank and use it later. It's now or nothing. And so this issue, this question becomes very, very important. Not important in the sense that it's important to businesses. I mean, I have taken, I've even taught time management classes. Uh, when I was at World Vision, Ted Engstrom and uh, Ed Dayton were two men <coughs> that created a Christian time management course. I've taken that a couple of times, I've taught it, you know, and yet, there's a difference between that, which is an effort to gain um, efficiency in your work. I mean, and there's, you know, there's all sorts of different, you know, different programs and books and to try to make you more efficient, to keep you focused, to get more work done. We're not talking about how do you spend your time in terms of how do you get more done. How do you spend your time in the right way, in a way that's honoring to God and consistent with His will? That's what we're talking about. We'll get into that. To start with that, we have to see, as I mentioned, that God does not experience time as we do. God does not feel the pressure of seconds and minutes and hours and days. And there's a couple of verses that are very clear about that. I mean, it's in a lot of the scripture, but Psalm 94, 90, verse 4 says, A thousand years in your sight, God, are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. 2 Peter, the New Testament, 3, 8, 9 says, With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. God is not subject to time the way we are. So when we are talking about using our time as, in terms of Christian stewardship of that resource, our values need to be different because we are talking about it in the context of a God who doesn't have the same values about time that, you know, the... Day planner, day timer, cubby planner, Franklin planner, people do, all right? Francis Schaeffer, theologian, philosopher that you may be familiar with, had a symbol that he used for the relationship of God to time. And it is this. The straight line is time, the passage of time. Surrounding that, encompassing that, not limited to it, but entirely you know, above it, below it, before it, and after it, there is the symbol of God. And so the idea that in his infinity, God completely encapsulates time. All right? Now, we're on this line somewhere, okay? This is us. This is God. The, the image that I have often used for this is because it, it, it helps me in a couple of ways. One, it helps me understand how God can be in all, at all times that God is not limited to time. But it also helps understand, I think, how God is not limited to one place at a time. We know that time is a, is, is a continuum, right? It's a, it's a sequence. For each of us, it began when we were born. 
and time as we know it will end when we die. Now there'll be something else that happens between that and the time Jesus comes back, if there's a gap in there, but that's not what we will experience this time. To me, the image that, that helps is to think of a straight line track of miniature railroad. Okay, a train, a miniature train. We are on one of those cars. And so as we move along in that car, on that train, we are experiencing, we're seeing different things out the window. We're experiencing different things as we go along. We're not experiencing what came before, and we haven't yet experienced what's going to happen. We are limited to that one place or time where that train is right then. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now think about God being the one who built this model train, and he's standing over it. And God can reach down here to where the track starts, or down here to where the track ends, or anywhere in between at any time he wants. He is not limited to only experiencing one place in the track at one time. He's above that, and he can reach down and touch it all. That helps me both understand how God can be in all time at once. He's not limited by time, but also in any place at once. He can reach down to that place, or to that place, or to this place just as easily. He is both you know, omnipresent, and he is outside time. Make sense? So, to me, I mean, that, that's, it's like this is the train track. I mean, using Francis Schaeffer's symbol, it's like the straight line of the train track, and the circle is the fact that God is above it and can interact with any of it he wants to at any time he wants to. God is not limited by time in the way we are. Does that all make sense? Yes. Okay. C.S. Lewis. And this is actually in, not in your Christianity or one of his apologetic books, you know, the Abolition of Man or Miracles or anything else. This is in Screwtape Letters. This is Screwtape advising his nephew, you know, the, the junior tempter. Um, and he says, he's describing how humans respond to things. And he says, humans live in time and therefore attend chiefly to two things. That means, you know, in time. We get one minute at a time. We're in it. They attend to eternity itself and to the present, for the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Now, you've spent a long time considering what that means, but basically that means that in this whole long track, I'm using the analogy again, which is eternity for us, I mean it's from the start of time to the end of time, we touch it at some one point. But at the same time, we at least consciously are aware of the fact there is a past and there is a future. There was a beginning, and as Christians, we believe there will be an end. One of the things that's different about the Christian faith is that we don't believe everything just goes in a cycle so that there's no beginning and no end. See, the, the philosophies and religions that believe the universe has always been and the universe will never end are the ones that believe in that cycle, you know, that, like a giant merry-go-round. We don't, we don't see time that way as Christians. There was a beginning when God created and then for each of us, there, as a subset of that, there's a point in which we were born. It is a continuum, a straight line, which is a sequence of both instance and of event that will at some point reach the end of the track, which is when God will say, enough. You know, that's time. <laughs> Literally, time. And time will come to an end, and we will enter into eternity, which is his thing. We live in a present which touches that line which represents eternity, which will go on forever. So in one way, we expect there will be an end to time as we know it, but we expect there will be an eternity beyond that. John? In reference to the train analogy, Stephen Char Charnock, a great uh, uh, theologian in 1765, I think, wrote a book, and he said, he said, God is his own eternity. I think about that. Okay. I mean, God and the train are one. Yeah. Um, there actually is another quote that Lewis has, which is similar to that. Um, if I can find it real quick here. He says, To him, God, all the physical events and all the human acts are present in an eternal now. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning every moment's the same. And in one, if you think about that, one of the striking things about that is that Jesus, as the Son of God, who is eternal and divine, experiences his sacrifice for us every moment forever. Okay? He goes on to say, the liberation of finite wills and the creation of the whole material history of the universe, related to the acts of those wills and all its necessary complexity, is to him a single operation. In this sense, God did not create the universe long ago, but creates it at this minute, at every minute. And in fact, that all of it is 
consumed in God. All of it is part of God. Okay. Well, one thing that really adds that is, adds to that is that um, putting in perspective, He's been to your tomorrow. He knows what your tomorrow is. Right. That's why He's preparing you today for what is coming tomorrow. And if we could ever keep that in perspective. I think some of the things we go through would be a lot more easily accepted. Yeah, and there are a lot of ramifications of that. For instance, the realization that nothing is is outside God's sight or outside His control. He knows as well what's going to happen tomorrow and next week and next year as He knows what's happening right now or last week. Unlike us, see, we, we make God made us in His image, but instead we try to make God in our image, and that includes giving Him our limitations. Um, there's mosquitoes in this room. I attract mosquitoes like <laughs> they could patent that and then kill them when they arrive or wherever, you know, my legs, that would be great. Okay, so let's talk about, so what is our job? What is our task? If we talk about having a stewardship of time, I believe it is to determine how best to use the time God has allotted to us. That's what I mean by stewardship of time. How, do we, how are we going to use it? To use time wisely, living in a way that pleases God and accomplishes His purposes. You notice it did, not, it did not say living in a way that gets the maximum amount of productivity in, which is what all the other time management things are, because all of them are related to business. That doesn't mean you're not supposed to be efficient when you're doing business. But when we're talking about life stewardship, whole life stewardship, and particularly the stewardship of time, we're concerned about what pleases God and what accomplishes God's purposes. Not what makes the most profit for whatever company we're working for by us being more efficient. Okay. Two verses related to that. Psalm 90 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Number our days means for us to be aware of our days as they pass and, and intentional about how they are being used. All right. And then James 4, in case we start thinking it all really is about us and that it's critically important that we never be out of touch with anybody because the world will end if somebody can't reach us by telephone and so busy, 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 go, go, go. James 4 says, why you, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, and this was, this was in context of I will... You know, I'll go to this town and I'll sell this and I'll make money and I'll, then I'll build barns and, you know, all this kind of stuff was the preface to this. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Which has to do with time, because this and that occur in time, right? As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. The idea is we think of time as something we have that's so full and so busy and everything going on. Instead of stepping back and saying, Lord, this is yours. You own it. You've allotted a certain amount of it to me. What is your good pleasure for how I use it? That's what stewardship of time means. Not making our own decision about, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to fill my day and I'm going to get that. Just, 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 just. That's not the good stewardship of time from a Christian perspective. Okay? So how do we know? how we should proceed with creating a stewardship of time that is honoring to God and fulfills His desires for us. Well, the primary model we have is Jesus, as in so many other things. If we look at Jesus' life, and particularly with regard to how He used time, how He was a steward of the time that He had while He was on earth, when I'm talking about his divine presence prior to his being born as a baby or after his ascension. But during his time on earth, when he was under the same parameters we are, when Jesus was a human being, when he set aside the claim to all of his divine power, he didn't stop being divine, but he set aside his, his, his pop, the kenosis, that he set aside his access to his power willingly. He was in the same situation we're in. He had seconds, and he had minutes, and he had hours, and days, and years. He had pressures on him. I mean, after all, his goal was to save you know, the, world. the world, to save all eternity. So that's a little pressure. So how did he deal with time, and how he used time? Several things we can observe. One, Jesus never hurried, he never worried. We had a friend who used to say, never hurry, never worry. And that's sort of a joke. But it's true. Jesus, in fact, frustrated people because he didn't hurry to the next thing. You'll remember, word came to him that Lazarus 
was very sick and at the point of death, his friend, Lazarus. And Jesus, having heard that, spent several more days doing what he was doing. And when he showed up at the home of Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, both of them individually, because they met him separately, they both said the same thing. If you had just been here, he would not have died. Like, what took you so long? <laughs> All right? But Jesus was not driven by that. He never hurried from one thing to the next. The only time we ever see him really sort of get, you know, energized by something is when he drove the money changers out of the temple. You know, other than that, he was, you know, he took things as they came, including even his arrest, his, you know, uh, his trial, and his crucifixion. This is part of a model for us. Things will happen in God's time, in His will, one way or the other. Do not get blown out about this stuff. Secondly, Jesus never had a sense of panic or remorse for time lost. You'll notice when Mary and Martha said to him, if you had just been here, Jesus would go, oh man, I screwed up. I really should have been, I could have been here two days ago. Man, I messed up. No, there was never a sense in which Jesus felt remorse for lost time. You, you never lose time. Time passes. You never lose time. You may not have spent it well, but you don't lose it. And you don't save it either, by the way. We have all these expressions, saving time, losing time. None of them are Kill, real. Killing time. Killing time, killing time. that's <laughs> it. My grandfather used to say, he had a little, a little plaque that said, if you want to kill time, try working it to death. That's our grandparents, right? Okay. Um, also, people, we can look at Jesus' life and realize that he took 30 years apparently working as a small town carpenter before he started his earthly ministry. Was that time wasted? We don't know anything about him after his, you know, eighth day when he was presented at the temple. And when he started his ministry, we think at about age 30, other than one event when he was 12 years old and he went to Jerusalem and astounded everybody with his knowledge of the temple. Other than that, we have no clue. We believe because it was a tradition for boys and young men to take up their father's profession, and we know that Joseph was a carpenter. The expectation, the assumption is that Jesus became a carpenter and ran a carpenter shop in Nazareth for, you know, from the time he was able to work until he was 30 years old. Is that wasted time? I mean, we don't see any productivity out of that. That's not very good time management, is it? <laughs> I think Jesus knew what he was doing. And I think sometimes we need to recognize that there is time of preparation. There is time of, of some of it is uh, physical strengthening and recovering. Some of it is learning. Some of it is gaining strength of what uh, other kind we need. Uh, there's a quite interesting book called uh, In God's Waiting Room, which is all about the fact that often God calls us to spend time waiting before he's ready for us to go. And Jesus spent 30 years. Marvin? I was thinking of Moses, 40 years in the wilderness after he killed the first Egyptian. Yep. And then uh, Abraham as well. I'm going to make your father a great nation. And he couldn't wait. He says, you know, let's get on with this. I'm getting old. Yeah. Uh, we got to just take... Well, and the Israelites in the wilderness, yep. 40 years wandering around. You know, um, there's a lot of 40 years of waiting in places. Uh, yeah. Moses, well, the wilderness. Yes. When you look at any man that the Father used for a particular time. These were men who were prepared, who had, who had been prepared in obscurity, away from the, the, the eyes of everybody. For the most part, no, yes. No attention. Yes. You know, and, it, and, and that's, that hasn't changed. Right. You know, and you have, you have examples of, um, well, we'll talk about some examples in a little while, of some of the people in, we're going to talk about during opportunities, but it's the same thing. Time and opportunities are, not even opposite sides of the same coin. You know, they're almost two facets of a diamond that are still touching one. But we'll, we'll get into that. So, Jesus spent 30 years in preparation, growing up, maturing. It says he grew in wisdom. Okay, uh, after the 12-year-old event in a, at the temple. Jesus' ministry was to change the world for all eternity, to provide salvation for a world that was lost. And yet he showed no signs of, of, of obsessive drivenness. No, hurry, 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 gotta go, gotta go. You know, da 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 da. You know, it's 
there's never any sense in which he suffered from any of those things that people who find themselves feeling important about the very important work that they do go through. No drivenness, no insomnia, no, um, you know, can't turn my phone off, no, none of that drivenness. And yet, whoever had a more important job than him? Should we not learn something from that? <laughs> Jesus' focus was people, even when that was inefficient. Okay, don't have time for you right now. I got to go. Jesus' focus was the people that he was ministering to, and that took priority over everything else. I have known a few, very few people, who I think had this same ability. And I told the story about Johnny Erickson Tata. Uh, I worked with Johnny. Johnny Erickson Tata broke her neck when she was uh, when she was 16. Um, I worked with Johnny, and I was with her one day. A young, she has a lot of fans, and especially young girls who, you know, read about what happened to her at 16 and what she's become. Um, an extraordinary ministry and inspiration. One day, a young girl, probably 15 or 16, had showed up and wanted to meet Johnny. And Johnny was always so gracious. She, and she's one of the people who had this ability that whoever was in front of her right that second was the most important person alive. And this is a real story. She's sitting talking to this young woman, and I was in her office because she and I had been working on, on writing an article. And so the young girl came in, and Johnny's sitting there talking with her, you know, and just really, paying, you know, really focused on her. Johnny's assistant, Judy Butler, came to the door, and, and this was when uh, Ronald Reagan was president, and Judy was on the commission for the that led to the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Ronald Reagan had appointed her on that commission. Well, Judy comes to the door and says. Um, Johnny, uh, President Reagan is on the phone, would like to talk to you. And Johnny's looking at this 16-year-old girl, or 15 or 16, and says, well, I tell him I get back to him later. <laughs> and Judy said, Johnny Tata, the President of the United States, is on the phone, and I think you need to take his call. And she went, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Wheeled the chair around and went over to her phone. The idea was, I don't care who it was, this 15 or 16 year old girl that she was talking to about her life sitting in front of her was more important. Okay, that, that, that's following the model of Jesus. The person in front of him was more important than anything else. That's one of the reasons why he never seemed like he was in a hurry, why he was late. You know, he was ministering to other people and he was late getting to Lazarus, knowing that that was not going to be a problem, because of his focus on the people in front of him right then. I don't have that kind of focus. I wish I did. Mm -hmm. I need to try to encourage it more because these are all things we can, we may not become perfected in, but we can grow in. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Next, at some of the most pressing times in his ministry, Jesus went away to spend time with the Father or with his friends. I mean, after feeding the 5,000, all these people are clamoring for him. So many people he had to get in a boat and push off from the shore a little bit and like the Sea of Galilee in order to be able to talk to them because they threatened to push him into the water. They were so adamant. Jesus, immediately following that, says, you know, see you guys later. And he goes off into the mountains to pray and to spend time in fellowship with his Father. There were other times when he took some of his uh, apostles, disciples, they, they hadn't been appointed that yet, and said, let's go off together. And he took them off to teach them, to train them, to spend time with them, you know, to make s'mores. I mean, we don't know exactly. <laughs> but they, Jesus, the idea that I can't take a vacation, there's too much to do, is, is itself a sign of there being something wrong with how we understand the use of time. Jesus, again, most important job ever, he took time away to recuperate, to rejuvenate himself spiritually and physically, to spend time with, with those he was closest to, what amounted to his extended family. Are we so important that we can't do that? Or do we need to understand that as part of what our use of time is about? It's also true that Jesus never fixated on activity at the expense of a right attitude. Okay? I know I'm really grumpy right now, but that's because I'm really feeling the pressure of this thing. That's not a good enough reason, Ross. <laughs> Jesus maintained the right attitude both toward the Father and also toward the people he served. And the pressure never changed that. And I know we get, you know, we're human. We get pressured, we get grumpy, and ah, things, you know, strike us wrong, or we're, we have frayed edges. Yeah, 
But we need to be aware of the fact we have a model that we need to seek to be more like, for whom that was not an issue. Pardon? And that's, I think, because we feel we need to be in control of things. And Absolutely. We're, we're trying to make it happen, and we're going to make it happen now, and we're going to make it happen this way, and other people get in the way in circumstances. And if we could say, look, God is really in control, I will do my best, yes. and that's all he asks. Yeah. He doesn't ask you to get mad at everybody else. Or, right. You know, yeah. yeah, and he does, it doesn't mean, you know, that you take three-day vacations twice a week. You know, that's not what that means. Um, Proverbs says, you know, a little slumber, a little sleep, a little folding of the hands to rest, you know, and, and you don't eat, okay, basically. Um, that we do have a responsibility to work and to be efficient in some ways. But a primary issue here is not, it's not just efficiency when we talk about Christian use of time, but it's effectiveness. And sometimes effectiveness involves resting, and it involves slowing down, and it involves taking time to do things that aren't very efficient, but may be very effective. So it's a very different set of criteria, as in everything else in the Christian life. We have a different set of rules, a different set of guidelines. And one of those things has to do with the use of time. And Jesus gives us an example of the right attitude. No matter how busy it was, no matter how many people were clamoring for him, spending time with the Father was the thing that was a priority for him. Both as an act of worship and also for his own rejuvenation. And spending time with those he loved was important. So attitude is critical to that. So let's look at, I, I want to look now at uh, two sections of verses from Philippians 2. The first part has to do with attitude. And the second part I'm then going to break down and talk about as being essential aspects of good stewardship of time. So Philippians 2, 5 to 11, you guys have probably heard this. Your attitude, there it is, attitude, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. This is what I referred to earlier, the, kin the kenosis passage. That he did not grasp onto his divinity, but set his power aside in order to be like us. That doesn't mean he stopped being divine. Didn't mean he couldn't access the power when he needed to, you know, when he, just, when he wanted to walk on water or raise Lazarus from the dead or whatever else. But in order to relate to us and be one with us, he became fully human. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You don't get the feeling that Jesus was afraid to turn off his phone because somebody important might be trying to get hold of him. He humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. None of this, how important I am, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' very attitude of humility, of it not being all about him, and of rather his, his dependence upon the will of God the Father, which is exactly the opposite of this, go, 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 hurry, 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 you've got to get it done, I'm too important you know, to waste time with you people. It's that very thing about Jesus. His willingness to become the humble servant is the thing that will make him the one who is glorified, according to Paul in Philippians 2. All right? Now, this passage continues, and this is the section I want to spend more time on. Therefore, my dear friends, as a result of all that, having an attitude like Jesus and what Jesus did for us, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become fault, blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. I want to take three aspects of this and talk about it in terms of three of what I believe are the central elements as we think about Christian stewardship of time. The first one is, Paul tells us in this passage in Philippians 2, to work out your salvation. Specifically, it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Okay, first thing, work out your salvation doesn't mean work hard enough to earn it. That's not what it means. Work out literally means to work it to full completion. It's comparable to us saying, well, I'm going to work out, meaning I'm going to try to be healthier, stronger, fitter. 
So when it says work out your salvation, it means to fully experience all that your salvation means in your life. Your salvation is assured by the sacrifice of Jesus as you accept him. It doesn't mean you have to work to earn it. Or like working a field or working a math problem. It's not something working out your salvation does not, is not works righteousness. Okay? That's not what that word means. And we know that's not what it means because the very next thing it says is to allow God to work in us, to will and act according to his good purpose. It is God working in us. He, by the Holy Spirit, called us. By the Son, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, we are saved. And now our job is to, is, is to reach out for sanctification, to grow more like Jesus. That's what working out our salvation. Applying it to all of us. Right? Working out so that I spiritually become healthier in the same way that I work out in, in, on the treadmill to get physically healthier. Okay? Now, when it says to allow God to work in us, to will and act according to His good purpose, it means to let God direct our time and how we spend our time. That's what the activities are. I mean, you know, time is just one thing after another, right? One darn thing after another. The fact is that our time is filled up with activities. And so when we say, let God work in us to will and act according to His good purpose, it means let God direct our time and how we spend that time so that we can grow in our spiritual service to Him. To his good purpose, what God wants, what his desire is, what his good, in fact, his best intent for us is. So this all has to do with stewardship of our time and what we fill our time with. Okay? That also is the basis or focus of so many biblical metaphors. When it talks about us being the clay and God is the potter, you know, we are the branches, he is the vine, we are his soldiers, we are his watchmen, we are his servants, etc. All of those have to do with someone who is in service to someone else, in this case God, so that we are not our own. We have responsibilities to fulfill in order to rightfully pursue the assignments we've been given. Okay, so we're, we're not the primary subject in, in these sentences. We are the object. We are the clay, the branches, the soldiers, the watchmen, the servants. God's purpose, God's time, use of time, is the thing that drives us, not we ourselves. How we spend our time is a reflection of whether or not we really accept that God is in charge and we are His to command. And that there will never be greater joy than being obedient to those commands. It's not like it's an onerous thing. Any questions about the first one? Working out our salvation so that God can work in us to will and act according to His good purpose. That tells us what our priorities are in terms of how we use our time. Yes? Help me with this. Um, I, I would see work out your salvation as something a little bit different. The analogy of using it like working out to get healthier or working a field has a beginning and an end. That phrase there begins with continue to work out your salvation. Right. And how? With fear and trembling. The idea to me would be would be that when we're born again, the life is completely absorbed and viewed and translated in this perspective of salvation. And Paul is saying, live this life. Right. Or synonymously, live this salvation and work it out with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. I see that more as a natural working out than a deliberate effort put forth to work out something. I understand that point, but I see something, for me, and I may be wrong, but I see something that's more, um, um, uh, I use this hesitantly, more natural living the life, which is now translated as salvation, right. And it's a continual thing. It's a, it's my life is now absorbed. Okay, well, you we don't go there inevitably. We have to, you know, the analogy of working out physically, I think, is a valid one because if I stop working out today, what happens? I get fatter and weaker and slower, and I die sooner. Okay, in other words, it has to be an ongoing thing. In the um, theology class last term, we talked about sanctification, the process of becoming more holy. Ultimately, when Jesus returns, that will be you know, 
completed, fulfilled, in glorification. When we are made like Jesus, you know, we do not know, we do not yet know what he will be like, but we know we will be made like him, John says. So the idea is that ultimately we will be made completely um, righteous, glorified to be in his presence. But in the process, our life is one of trying to achieve more glorification. And we have to be we have to be consciously desiring that ongoing. Because if we don't, we slide backwards. Now, it's it, it's you're absolutely right that it says that God will work in us. But the point is, God never forces himself on anyone. And we have the volition, we have the potential volition, we have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to go that direction that God wants me to go. I'm going to do something else. Well, what happens when I make that decision? I take a step backwards in terms of my spiritual development. So to me, when it says work out your salvation, it means we be intentional and aware to continually seek to seek to be uh, like Jesus, to be, to follow the things of God. Yeah, and so to me, working that out your salvation means continue to seek to be better as God has told you to be better. Yeah, absolutely. What, the point I'm making is some people have interpreted that as, well, I'm going to work out my salvation because today is Sunday. Yeah, well. You know, or I'm going to Bible school, or I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something. What, what, what my argument is, it is not a start-finish type thing. It is no. deliberate, it is deliberate, but it is absorbed in this thing called life, oh. this salvation. And we will continue to grow and develop, and none of this perfection. The goal is to be as sanctified, as holy, as far along in the process of being like Jesus as we can, until we die or until he comes back. So that they, you know, we, we will be completely sanctified in glorification when he returns. But we have to be aware of that. I mean, you know, we talk about backslidden. The whole thing about backslidden is that occurs when you just stop trying to move forward, okay? You're no longer trying to climb. Now that doesn't, again, it doesn't mean you're earning your salvation. Your salvation is sure. It's an issue not of salvation, but of sanctification. Okay, first can and then Carol. Well, I think what, if, you, if you've if you ever done the Henry Blackaby Knowing God, when he talked, one of the very first things he talks about in our life in knowing God is that he point, points out the verses that talks about God is at work at all times. Mm -hmm. And so if we wake up and we look at, get, look around us and say, okay, God is working all around us and just approach every day with God, where are you working today and how can I be a part of it? Please show me how I can be a part of it. And that's, that may be, that's the same thing and maybe the attitude that you're looking for. Right, but the, the, the reason why this is part of time, stewardship of time, is that every day, every hour, right. I have to make a decision, which direction am I going to go? Am I going to seek after God? Am I going to pursue the activities and the time I have allotted that will bring me closer to Jesus? That's what to me working out my salvation means applying it more, more fully and more completely and more effectively to my life rather than having it be, you know, just make the wrong decisions, go the wrong way, let it slide. Okay? There is a volition associated with this. We have to make that decision every day. And because we have to do it every day and every minute and every second, that's why it's an issue of time, stewardship of time. Carolyn? Um, the, I don't know if you covered this, but I was kind of out. But um, the part about to let God direct our time, right. is um, that reminds me of the whole Dallas Willard thing about living next to Jesus all day long, every day. Right. And, and if you, I guess it all comes together for me if I think of it that way, because otherwise I, I don't intentionally not do God's will. I sort of slip without thinking. Right. It's not conscious, unless I'm consciously walking. Right. Him. Exactly right. We, without being conscious or intentional, we can slide away from God. Mm -hmm. In order to be able to continue to grow spiritually, the direction God wants us to go to, to honor Him and to meet His expect His desires for our lives, we have to be conscious of that. We have to be volitional. We have to be making those decisions all the time. And that's what I think work out your salvation means. Not do something to get saved, but have your salvation bear fruit in your life as you become more like Jesus. Okay, Marvin, then we need to go on. Um, two things I think he calls us to do. One is 
by this young all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And we can do that in the 40 years in the wilderness or wherever we are, be kind and loving to one another and be the light of the world in that sense. And the other thing was when he was questioned, how often, how often do you forgive? And he said, 70 times 7. You're going to forget whether it's 69 or 70. I mean, you're going to just be forgiving all the time. And those are things that are going to set us apart in this world that make us otherworldly. And the world will take notice if we can follow that. I believe. I agree. And it's good that that's true because there are a couple of people in this church that I'm reaching 490 right about now. <laughs> okay, let's keep talking. The second aspect of this from this same passage, from Philippians 2, 14 and 15, it says, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe. So the second aspect that we ought to look to in terms of our stewardship of time is how can we shine out with our testimony? What do we need to do? Not just, you know, the first part of it was for me. For me to work out my salvation, to become more like Jesus by making the right decisions and going in the right directions as God desires. Letting Him direct me to be alongside Jesus, as Dallas Willard talks about. Here is one where then how do I use my time in such a way that it becomes a witness, that I can shine like a star. Boy, that's a scary idea. You know, that I, that that's the expectation. It's actually the, you know, the encouragement, not so much that we're being given a burden, but we're being given a, an encouragement in terms of that image. We need to recognize too that like Paul, you know, like the Philippians, or the Corinthians, or anybody else that's existed since the beginning of humanity, since Adam and Eve, we live in a crooked and depraved generation, to quote this passage. A generation without hope or light. If you are not aware of the fact that this is a crooked and depraved generation, meaning everybody that's alive today, the people who lived before us, could have said the same thing about the people who were alive when they were alive. And our children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews can say the same thing about their generations because humanity is broken. Humanity is crooked and depraved. And that means they are in need, because of their brokenness and crookedness and depravity, they need light. They need hope. And that's part of our job. And how we spend our time will make a huge difference. What decisions we make about how we spend our time, what activities we pursue in that time, will make a huge difference in terms of whether or not we are shining like stars to the people who need to, see the, need to have a light. Okay. And because of that, we then are commissioned to live by God's plans for us. When it says without fault here, it doesn't mean perfect. It means that you are doing your very best to be what God wants you to be, and far better than those around you in terms of the crook and the great generation. That in order for us to be light to the lost and to the broken, we need to accept the commission God has given us to live by His plan. That's how we become light. That's how we become the stars that show forth light in our broken world. By doing what God wants us to do. By spending our time making our decisions that take us in the direction that is honoring to Him. And people notice that. They will know you're my disciples. How? If you love one another. And love doesn't mean what we think of love as being, oh, just a Draw up this emotional feeling and try to get some. No, it means doing loving things, acting in a loving way. Then we become lights like stars. And that's directly related to how we choose to spend our time. The activities we pursue. Carolyn? It, it, it's not even what you choose to do, it's how you do it. I think it, the attitude yeah, is well, what it, says, yeah. it, it says do everything. Yeah. But it's without complaining or arguing. Yeah, I mean, clearly there's some things you shouldn't do if you want to be seen as a light for, you know, for yeah. Jesus. Sure. Um, and there's some things you should do. But much of it, as you say, is, and as this suggests, it's how you go about it, how you do it. I mean, if, if your child is unruly, you can reprimand your child in a way that people are going to find, find as gracious and you know, reflecting Jesus, or you can do it in a way that people are going to think about calling the cops on so whatever we do, we can decide, are we going to do it in a way that's honoring to Jesus or not? But it also involves making the decisions as to, given the time I have, what activities am I going to pursue? Did you have your hand up? No. Thank okay. you. Okay. 
So the third part of this passage I want us to look at is hold out the word of life. So the first passage um, had to do with us growing to be more like Jesus. That's how we spend our time pursuing those things. The second is to, to spend our time in events and activities that God directs us to so that we can be a witness to others. And the third is hold out the word of life. Philippians 2.16, as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. We are able to stand against evil because God has spoken his word, both in the incarnate Christ and in scripture, so that we may then go in the name of Jesus and transform the world. We have the opportunity. Now, this means not just the way we live our lives being a light, which is what the second passage was. This means we actively go and do something about it. Hold out the word of life. To tell people what Jesus has done for us actively. Not passively, which is what the second, the, you know, being lights like stars is more a passive thing. It's what people will see in our lives. This means being active, to spend our time in active ways that represent the grace and love and healing and salvation of Jesus. Okay? Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Meaning we've got to go someplace and do something when we get there. We're going to talk about this a little bit more when we talk about opportunities. Because uh, these opportunities come out there. Yes, Lynn? Isn't it kind of simple what we've been talking about attitude and we've been talking about plan and walking with Jesus? But if you don't do the walk, you just have the right. plan. I got the plan. Right. And don't put any action in it, it's useless. Well, and these three things, I believe, give us kind of a, it's, and it's a sequence mm -hmm. that we are to seek ourselves to be more like Jesus. Okay? We are to live our lives and commit ourselves to the kind of actions and activities and attitudes that will reflect the light of Jesus. But then we have to be proactive in actually doing, holding out, going to, interacting with, serving in the name of Jesus to provide the word of life. Okay. John? What gives me immense hope is where he spoke just a few, few verses above where he says, for it is the Father that works both in you to will and to do right. his good pleasure. That is a profound. It's profound not just by our power. Okay, we're not doing this by our power. We have to make the decision because again, God does not force anybody. But I wouldn't I wouldn't minimize that. That's the problem with the modern Christianity. I think modern Christianity minimizes that and embraces their own self-effort to try to to improve and, and to do these things. That's the that's the danger that I, I see is is, is is real easy to fall into. It is, but it's also easy to fall into the, to the failing of saying, you know, it's up to God. Yeah. All right. There's a new episode of Mad Men. Mad Men on. It's up to God to to do whatever. Okay. Um, it is God's work, and He desires to do it how through us. It is God working in us and through us. We have to agree to let it. That's the point of all of this. That God, it's God who does the work, but we are the medium by which he does that. And we have to be willing to let him do it. So that's what, and, and that involves how we choose to spend our time. And what our attitude is with the things we choose to fill our time with. Okay. I want to, I've got to move forward so we can take a break and then get on to opportunities. So these three central elements, I believe, that comes from Philippians 2 and our Christian stewardship of time. Working out our salvation making myself what God wants, shining out your testimony, being the light by how we live our lives, how we act, our attitude to others, and then holding out the word of life, the practical doing of stuff. For Christians, and I suggested this earlier, the issue of managing our time is not efficiency as in business, getting the most done in the shortest period of time, as much as it is spiritual effectiveness. Jesus was not concerned about numbers, but rather the value of every individual soul. So the two questions I think we need to ask ourselves when we think about how we spend our time is, what is really going to have mattered when I come to the end of my early days? And second, how does, which is related to it, these things overlap, how does God want me to spend my time in ways that will both honor Him in my own life and effectively share Him with others? Me growing in a way that honors God, me being the medium by which God is able to and to finish up our discussion of time, I think it's finished up, I don't get any more. Well, one more. 
What will be the measure of our lives? The length of our lives does not matter. God has done miraculous things with those who died young, but were committed to Him. In your books, you guys read the story of, um, of William Borden, who died in his 20s, and yet his, his story continues to be an inspiration for people even, even today. The number of people who, in God's will and wisdom, He took young, and yet, in some cases, exactly the fact that they died so young was one of the things that inspired people so much. How long we live doesn't matter. It's depth that matters, not length, but depth. The depth of our devotion to God is reflected in how we spend our time on earth, what decisions we make, what activities we pursue, how our time is filled. Even the most mundane of tasks become sacred. And you remember the definition of sacred we talked about in theology class. It means something is sacred if it is committed to God or to, any, to a religious purpose, if it's committed to holiness. So our most mundane tasks can be made sacred and have eternal value when they're dedicated to God and His glory rather than just our own self gratification So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I did a, a talk at a Rotary Club a couple weeks ago, two weeks from Saturday, I guess. They're launching a new Rotary. And I, the talk I did had to do with service. And I used an example in that of the Recoleta Cemetery in Buenos Aires. Um, I was talking about the purpose of our lives. And if you've been to Recoleta, it's a cemetery right in the middle of Buenos Aires. And it's considered one, it's one of the most famous and one of the most beautiful cemeteries in the world. There are almost 5,000 people buried there, in, in, including Ava Peron, for instance. But like our guide took us around to all these, and there, these things are made out of marble and granite and stained glass. There are windows on these mausoleums, and they're just some of them are two or three, or three, three or four stories tall, and beautiful statuary and just amazing pieces of art. But then there are some of them that have weeds growing around them, and the glass is broken out, and you know, are in terrible shape. Well, the realization that. These people, and there are presidents and other politicians and authors and um, sports figures and all, they, all manner of famous people. Um, and I was really moved by, Carolyn and I visited there, we had a tour guide with the Hansons. Um, all of these different people, and our guy's telling us about this famous boxer and this president and this, you know, this person who was the first one to do blah, blah, blah. And I, and I think this is true for Carolyn too, I have never heard of any of those people, not one of them, except Ava Perone. And Ava Perone is whatever, she's very controversial. You know, the reason she's well known today, besides Evita, you know, the movie and the play, is because of her life of service to the poor. Whatever else you might say politically about Ava Perone and her husband Juan Perone and how she came to a power from being sort of a loose lady and all that, she worked very hard to care for the needs of the poor. The poor people of Argentina still love her. You know, she is the patron saint of the poor. And yet, we didn't know anybody else there. And so what does it mean if we spend our lives doing what the world says is important, gaining prestige, gaining fame, gaining money, so that what? We die, and either by our plans or the plans of our family, they built some giant monument using marble that was brought from Milan. And a generation from now, nobody's going to even know who we were. And in fact, um, other than family members, in the, in the case of those mausoleums that were completely uncared for, clearly nobody, nobody remembers who that was, because they're not even taking care of their, you know, their tomb. Is that what our life is for? Or is it that we seek to use our time to serve the things of God, to serve the people in the way that Jesus proved God wants us to? Isn't that the priority we should be seeking? All, in other words, all of the things, again, that the world tells us are important, that we ought to be focusing our energy and attention on, are wrong. Gaining wealth, gaining power, gaining fame. You end up with a very expensive tombstone. And nobody will remember you. You know, there may be a picture on somebody's wall five generations from now. They go, oh, I think that was my great-great-grandfather or uncle or something. Or do we honor God? By the way, we make our decisions and we spend our time. 
So what will be the source of our satisfaction? Every day we make decisions about how we'll spend our time, and we need to be asking ourselves, what is the criteria on which I'm deciding what I will spend my time on? Is it God's will, or is it what the world tells us? Remember, when we talk about spending your time, time is a resource. It's something we have, and you have to spend. You have 86,400 seconds today. You have to spend it. You can't save it. So how are you deciding what you're going to spend it on? I think if we recognize this is the day that the Lord has made, this time, this day, this hour, this minute is His. He made it. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If we always keep that in mind, then we are focusing on the things of the Lord with the time we have and spend. The only true source of satisfaction and happiness is found in the Lord and our service to Him as good stewards of the time He has allowed to us. Stewardship of time. And the things we use, we fill up our time. Okay, let's take a break. Okay, okay uh, let's talk for a few minutes about stewardship of opportunities. And as I say, these aren't time and opportunities aren't just flip sides of the same coin. They really are sort of connect, you know, adjacent facets of a diamond. Um, and I would start by asking the question: Have you ever missed an opportunity and regretted it later? Uh, we have all sorts of sayings about you know opportunity never knocks twice and all that. Of course it does, but you know. Um, <clears throat> I think the reality is almost all of us have experienced a natural tendency, which inertia, I mean, to use a physical definition, a natural tendency to do what is expected and comfortable rather than the risky and potentially extraordinary things. All right? It's very hard to get us off our bottoms when opportunities come along, especially if there's something we're not real sure about. Um, so I think we need to be aware that sometimes we have to make decisions that will be contrary to what our first and natural inclination are if we're going to take advantage of opportunities. Yeah. And I'm not talking about that just in terms of like investment at all, in terms of investing opportunities or whatever. I mean, you could do a lot with this. I'm talking about opportunities that we believe come from God, that God puts in our, in our path and that we have to make a decision for. And so um, we always need to remember that as a Christian, which is a commissioned servant of the Most High God, we are... Um, in an inherently adventurous business. You know, we are explorers in a world that is a jungle by comparison to what we believe is true and right. And so we've got to be prepared to be adventurous about stuff, and that means taking advantage of opportunities. Scripture verse, Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. We seek the Lord's will. We talked about making, you know, Him being the one who helps direct us in terms of how we use our time. But also, we seek the Lord's will to know which opportunities are from Him in order that we may be able to take advantage of those opportunities in a time and in amongst the people where there is evil. You know, we, we are the explorers. We're the ones that are supposed to be blazing those trails. But it's not easy. Now, yes, Cornelius. What's that? Peter and Cornelius. Well, Peter and Cornelius. Um, scripture is full of individuals for whom that is true, who seized opportunities. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Deborah, David, Daniel, Esther, Nehemiah, Peter, with Cornelius the, the Roman centurion, the first Gentile convert, Paul, and on and on. Every one of those people, you go back and look at their stories, and you realize that they took, God gave them an opportunity and they grabbed hold of it and took it. Deborah is a great example. You know, the story of Deborah and Barak, who was the, the head of the armies of uh, Israel, or that area, region, they were sort of working on my tribes then. But Barak was the general and God told Deborah that the Canaanite enemies they had, Sisera was the general of the Canaanite army, that Deborah was, um, was given an opportunity by God to lure Sisera into a trap so that Barak, as general of the armies of Israel, could destroy them. And Deborah said, okay, Barak, get your armies ready. I'm going to lure him into this trap, and then you guys can crush him. God said it's going to be so. And Barak said, now wait a minute. I'll go, but only if you go with me. Because I'm not sure you know what you're talking about, basically. That's where I'll says it. 
And so I'm not going out doing this alone. You're going to have to be there too, Deborah, who was the judge of that area. And Deborah said, okay, fine. I will do what you've asked, and God will make the victory happen, but you won't get credit for it, Barak, even though you're the general of the army. A woman will get credit for it. Barak thought that Deborah meant she was going to get credit for it, but in fact, what happened was the army of Israel destroyed the Canaanite army, except Sisera, the general, escaped. And capturing the general was considered like the, that's the most important part about defeating an army almost back then. Sisera escaped. He, he gets away and he approaches a tribe and a woman named Jael, who he believed were on friendly terms with his boss, the king of the Canaanites. And so he said, oh, I'm really tired of this. And Jael said, don't worry about it, come in, you know, come into my tent, give you some warm milk, cover you with a blanket, you can get some rest. And you know, oh, great, as he lays down. Well, she proceeds to take a tent peg and a mallet and drive the tent peg through his temple Fastening his head to the ground. <clears throat> JL got credit for the victory, even though she only killed one guy. And Barak led the forces of Israel to defeat the whole Canaanite army. And then it says they had 40 years of peace with no more trouble from the Canaanites after that. Well, Barak did not seize an opportunity. Even though God had spoken to Deborah, who was recognized as being a judge through whom God spoke, but Jael, this woman living in a tent amongst the nomadic peoples, who knew the things of God versus the things of the Canaanites, the true God, she did take advantage of an opportunity that, that included a tent peg and a mallet. <laughs> and she was credited as being, you know, and that sounds horrendous to us, but she got credit for the victory and in the process brought peace for 40 years to the Israelites, okay? So claiming, seizing those opportunities. Um, Barak, eh, he's, a, he's a name in the file, not, yes? Um, you know, most of those guys didn't recognize the opportunities. They were afraid and they, 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 they obeyed God and then later, it was discovered that these had become opportunities. Well, so what the, the motive, I would suggest that the motive was not they were seizing opportunities. The motive was they were obeying God. They well, that's right, because they knew the opportunity was from God. I'm not even sure they break it. Most of them Well, we the disagree. Now, a couple of them, like Noah and Moses, were reluctant. And it took some convincing. But there are others, like Abraham. God speaks to Abraham. And he doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know what's going to happen when he gets there. But he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He took the opportunity to follow God because God said, if you do this, I will make you the father of great people. I will give you a land for your own. And through you, I will bless all the peoples of the earth. Now, that was an opportunity. And Abraham said, yeah, this is a risk, but I'm going to go with it. Um, you had Joshua, Joshua and Caleb, the only two who saw the opportunity to take the promised land. And yet the other 10 spies said, no, 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 the fortresses are too strong, the people are too big, we can't do that. And so they wouldn't do it, even though Moses and Joshua and Caleb said they should, and so they wandered 40 years in the wilderness till all the males died. Joshua was prepared to take that opportunity. When Joshua was on, you know, on across the, the Jordan River, and God said, tell the priest to pick up the Ark of the Covenant and walk forward until their feet <coughs> are in the water, which is where we get the expression getting your feet wet. And Joshua didn't say, no, wait a minute, you know, that, that river's deep, you know. He said, pick up the Ark, guys, walk forward until your feet are in the water. He took that opportunity, whatever risk it was, knowing that there were powerful cities. You know, he walked seven times around uh, the powerful, powerful, um, city of Jericho, not knowing, but and yet he, he trusted God, that God was giving them an opportunity, and God tore down the walls. Um, you know, I, I see each of these. In every case, those people would have had an opportunity to say no. Mm -hmm. See, that's when I say play, grasp an opportunity. It means saying yes instead of saying no. And all of them said yes. So really, that's, the, that's what we mean by, by 
seizing an opportunity is that saying yes when God tells you to do something rather than saying no. Um, and sometimes it involves great risk. Most of those people, there was great risk involved. And yet they said yes. They took the opportunity God gave them. Yes, Mark. Jonah said no, and it didn't work out the way Yeah, not the first time. You know, well, if you don't do it, somebody else will. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we saw what happened. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I, I think, too, we need to see, ask ourselves, what opportunities has God, or does God, speaking in the present tense, in the present and future, place before us? And I want to talk about three kinds of opportunities that I think are, are the kinds of opportunities God gives us. The first one, and again, you'll see how this relates to the things we talked about um, in, under time. The opportunities to evangelize. Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This, the Great Commission, is a primary, almost the primary, other than accepting Jesus himself, almost the primary assignment for all Christians. It's the last thing Jesus told his followers before he ascended into heaven. Which means, you know, just like a, I don't want to draw this analogy too far, but just like a deathbed confession, the last thing somebody says before they go is considered viable in court, it's considered especially uh, true. There's a reason why this was the last thing on Jesus' lips, I believe, before his ascension. It is critical for us that we be prepared to share the good news, which is what gospel means, if you didn't know that. We share the good news of life and salvation for people who are looking for it, whether they realize it or not. And yet, do we do that? I don't do it as much as I should. I confess that right up front. My introvert thing takes over. I sit down next to somebody on an airplane, and the last thing in the world I want to do is to get involved in spiritual conversation with them. That is contrary to everything in my being. I need to work on that. I need to pray. I need to seek you know, a better sense of that. I actually told the cabbie that, that we had in London recently that he said, how do people believe all the crazy stuff they believe in the world, like Scientology? And I said, well, I believe that's because there's a spiritual evil being in the world that's trying to delude people. And he said, you mean you really believe that? You really believe in the devil? I said, yeah, I absolutely do. Well, maybe someday later I'll get to meet Cliffy again and you know, talk to him about the positive side of it. But how often are we really willing to do that? And to some extent, I mean, there is, a, you know, there is the introverted thing. There's all sorts of reasons why we might be inclined to. But for many people, I think it boils down to the question, do we really believe it? Really? If you have a car that you think is just a great car, and you know from experience that this is like the best car you've ever had, human nature is that we want to tell everybody that we meet, man, you wouldn't believe this great car. And Carolyn and I sold our car at CarMax. We had such a great experience. How many dozen people have we told about CarMax? All right? We go through our lives, and when we're experiencing something positive, it's like we're looking to meet people that we can tell about this experience. And so when we don't tell people readily about Jesus, is it maybe because we're, we don't really, really believe it, or at least it hasn't soaked in completely yet? Or it's more threatening to us, or whatever. I mean, you know, tell somebody that I love my Toyota when they're a Honda fan, and, you know, they hate Toyota, so it, you know, these things happen, but um, <laughs> still, we, opportunities to evangelize are one of the significant things in terms of opportunities that that gives us. Ken? I think, I mean, everybody has different giftings, and some people, it, it's, it's a more of a natural gift, but on the other hand, the more you do this, the more it will become real in your own heart, too. Mm -hmm. And I've had just fortunate experiences to share with people in the airport, all kinds of different crazy places, but every time I share, it becomes so much more more real to me that it makes it easier and more exciting to want to share the next time. Right. Uh, let me give you a let me give you a flip side of that. After I graduated from college, I was head resident of the dorm. I was working for the college I graduated from, and um, I also they asked me to be the, the sort of faculty sponsor, even though I wasn't technically faculty for the the campus radio station. And it was a carrier current station, you know, meaning it went through the electrical lines of the, it wasn't broadcast. And um, we needed some to fill in some holes in terms of our programming, and so I agreed to do a Christian radio program. Right? 
I know boys and girls, moms and dads, Jews and Gentiles, this is Doc Ross coming across the letter Roger Teasons. Uh, <laughs> other than it's a joke. But I remember that the, the, the station manager, who's a student, came up to me one time, and we were talking about this, and he had just heard Bob Dylan's Long Train Running album. And he said, I think it's the best Christian album I've ever heard. I had not heard of it. Bob Dylan had made a profession of faith and become a Christian and recorded this Christian album. And it is a great album. You know, songs on it like, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You know, great stuff. Later on, he sort of went back to his Jewish roots, okay? Never mind that. But the point is, when, when the station manager student told me that, my first reaction was, oh yeah, like right, it's become a Christian. And then the Spirit of God hit me right between the eyes and said, you know what, if you don't believe that he could come to me, then you don't really believe in me. Because if it's true, then it's true for everybody. Even celebrities. And I really had to deal with that. Okay? Um, so that's... I believe everybody who accepts Jesus is saved. I don't care what their salary is or their title is or you know, how famous they are. But my first reaction was sort of like, do I really believe? I had to ask myself, well, do I really believe it then? If I don't believe that that could be true for Bob Dylan too? Alright? So we need to ask ourselves that question. And is that a factor in whether or not we are prepared? To accept opportunities to share Jesus. Marvin? As a baby Christian, I was uh, recruited into the standing on street corner to give out tracts. And, and we did find that a lot of people didn't appreciate that. Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it wasn't the wisest way to. Uh, so sometimes people are not ready, or sometimes we don't have, how can I say, the right to just barge in and start. Well, you know. But there are, there are good ways and exactly. right ways yeah. and wrong ways to do it. Exactly. And we need to make sure that we don't take. A wrong way yeah. and use that as an excuse for not doing it at all right because there are right ways to do it yeah okay and, uh, yeah uh, very briefly i think some people are just afraid you know it's real to them yeah they have a real experience with christ but they're just afraid because they don't have command with this verse and that verse and that sort of thing exactly and i'm reminded i'm reminded of the blind man who got his uh, jesus healed him and and the, the only thing these pharisees when they came to him they questioned him they cued him they 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 wanted to know what's happening, and he, and he finally just says, listen, I don't know who this guy was. All I know is I was blind, and now I can see. So do you want to be his disciple too? And <laughs> if, when I see that, I think, you know, evangelism is just telling somebody with that degree of excitement that you experienced when you first got saved that you were blind, and now you can see. The, the old saying, which is very appropriate, is that uh, witnessing is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Right? Exactly. Um, and, and it's very true, and I think you're correct. It's not just that people may not believe it, but they may not be confident in it. And that's one of the reasons why you're here. You know, that's one of the reasons why we should study, why we should learn, why we should... That's the reason we're teaching the philosophy classes, because sometimes we need to know enough about well, the way that, you know, the kinds of things the world is likely to base their arguments on in order for us to understand what our beliefs are. Yes? The Jehovah's Witnesses are unbelievable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, with answering questions and knowing what to say. They train and train and train. Right. Knowing full well that you're going to ask these questions as you, and when they come to your door, and they're totally prepared. I have to admire that. Well, it, it's true, and, and we should take it as an indictment against our lack of understanding training. I do have to tell you a quick story, though. A friend of mine in college had been sort of drawn in by two Mormon missionaries on the campus, and she was beginning to believe this stuff. She'd been loosely part of the Christian fellowship. Well, another friend um, who had a wicked sense of humor, she said, okay, let me go with you to talk to these guys. And they went to talk to those guys. And, and so after they talked for a while, she said, well, I have a question for you. I understand Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and all that, but why do you call yourself Mormons? And the guy heard, said, well, the angel Moroni appeared and gave the revelation you know, that led to that. She said, the angel Moroni, huh? And they said, yes. Morons. She said, well, then why don't you call yourself morons? <laughs> <laughs> and when she said that, it's her friends started laughing, and it's like it broke the spell. All of a sudden, it didn't, nothing made sense of that to her anymore. Okay, so why don't you call yourself morons? Ken? I, you know, one of the ways that you really can stop a Jehovah's Witnesses 
ask him how sweet their quiet time was with the Lord this morning. Because in general, yeah. they're legalists. And well, they don't have a sweet quiet time. <laughs> I, there, there are a lot of things you can do. For me, the, the issue is that the, the commission says go and make disciples. It's not necessarily go and knock on somebody's right. str some stranger's door and say, "Do you are you going to heaven tonight if you die?" Yes, it, it's it's a bigger deal than that. It is, and it's true. I mean, I, in fact, I had an Anglican friend one time, and he said, "You know, the other Protestant denominations are always so concerned about bringing them in, but they don't seem to be concerned about bringing them up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that to grow in the faith." And I think that making of disciples is, you know, is a huge, huge part of it. It doesn't mean we don't, we shouldn't be ready to witness exactly. the truth of Jesus, you know, to tell people um, where we're coming from, what Jesus has done for us. And that but, goes to the training thing too, because yes. then if we are all disciples, we'd be trained. Exactly, you know, so. that we we'd be there, and we're, you know, again, that's why we're trying to do this stuff. Okay. So this, we have opportunities to evangelize is one of the opportunities God puts before us. And the second one is opportunities to empathize. Mm -hmm. To empathize means to identify with what others are thinking, feeling, or experiencing, to be compassionate. And the word compassionate literally means to suffer with another. Calm, with, passionate. The passion of Christ is the <laughs> suffering of Christ. It's the same root. Compassion means to suffer with. <coughs> So to be compassionate about another person's situation or need. The world is dying for somebody to just express some compassion, some empathy, some sense of relationship with. If we, don't, we don't climb up on a high horse and you know, shake our finger at everybody down below us and tell them how awful they are. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what we're called to do. Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you. <laughs> Notice, don't persecute them back. Don't, you know. Um, and I got one guy in the church right now that's persecuting me, and I'm having a whole lot of trouble blessing him. Okay, but uh, th that's the struggle. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. That is all a definition of what it means to empathize. And God gives us those opportunities simply to feel what somebody else is. Christians are way too quick when somebody is suffering a grief or a pain or whatever else, whatever trial or tribulation, to say, oh, well, don't worry about it. All things work together for them that close that love God or follow the great wisdom. All right? That's an evil thing to say to somebody when they are in their midst of their grief. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Not throwing a scripture at them like it were some truism, you know, like, which basically means buck up. That's not what Jesus did. Lynn? I think the important thing is we have to take the I, the ego, the, our agenda out of it and just say it's interesting that this person's been given this challenge or this, and that I am here to love them and care for them right. and, and to let them know that they are loved and cared for because most times that's the root of all our problems is right. we don't realize we are loved and cared for. And that's what we mean about to identify with. You know, yeah. To, oh, exactly. to, to identity, to share their identity, to be yeah, with them. But it takes the, the big eye out and yeah. just forget it. I think a lot of times when, when we come on people who are in a serious state of grief, uh, they won't ever remember what we said to them, but they will remember we cared. Yeah. Yes. Oh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I had my pastoral theology professor. He, he, um, he once said that when he first became ordained and so it, it happened a couple of times fairly early on in his first his first call, his first assignment in the church. It was a death in the family. He never dealt with anyone like that. He'd never known anybody close to him that had died. And so he did what a pastor's supposed to do. He showed up at the house, you know, where they had a home visitation. And he goes there and he said, you know, he said, I'm sitting around eating nuts for two or three hours and I you know, express my condolences and I'm, I'm silently praying for them and everything else. He said, I've never felt more awkward in my life. And he said both of those first two times. Afterwards, like days later, the bereaved person came up to me and said, thank you so much. It was so important to us that you were there. And he thought, what did I do? Well, he was there. That's all he could do. Okay. Uh, Pam? You think of all the children that are being um, crossing the border without parents and um, no direction and, and, of course, all kinds of bad things happening. And I'm just thinking how Christian it would be to rather turn on them 
and, and to provide something for them. And all you're hearing is how everybody's up in arms about these. Yeah. I saw photographs the other day of these of these civilians. I mean, they're not employed by any agency or anything else. In their their forerunners, uh, you know, their four wheel drive vehicles with what look like assault rifles, patrolling the border on the U.S. Mm -hmm. side. You know, and, and like everything I've read says that by the year 2020, we're going to be paying Mexicans to come to the United States mm -hmm. because by that time it will be so evident to us that without them we can't run our economy. And yet these guys have high-powered rifles thinking that they're doing a service keeping people from crossing the border. And I'm thinking, really? You know, every study that's been done says that even right now the agricultural business in the United States could not survive without illegal immigrant labor. John? Going back to the funeral, uh, several years ago when my mother died, um, I've been on the mission field. We, we go home for the funeral, and I've been I've been to funerals. We've all been to funerals and felt what that pastor felt. You know, just what, what am I doing here? You know, I don't have anything to say. It's awkward. But as one who lost their mother, and and I saw all these people come, I was I was shocked. I didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to. You know, they didn't have to. They, they didn't have to greet me. But to see them, and they'd come up and they'd hug me, and just, you know, it just, it just meant something. And, and in our community here, that, that can speak very, very loud, because we're, we're reaching that point where men and women will be graduating, you know, and how do we, how can we help them in that time? Yeah. Just being there, didn't have to do anything, just being there. I was impacted on how, what a difference it made, what an impact it made on me. And sometimes just being physically present is what's needed in order to identify with. You're just, you're there, and there's a sense of identity by your presence, okay? Uh, speaking of which, uh, segue here. A lot of you all knew Rich and Angie Cannell. Um, came to class for a long time. Angie had red hair, she usually sat back. Um, Angie passed away last month, and we were having a memorial service here for her on the 20th, here in the sanctuary at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Red hair, tiny glasses, tiny, tiny. tiny. Yes. Yeah. Um, so she was in a lot of the classes. So, but again, she would sit in that chair usually because she often had to get up and go out because she wasn't well. Um, anyway, just let me know that. So the idea of opportunities to evangelize, opportunities to empathize, and then opportunities to act for others. See, the first one is sharing Jesus. The second one is caring identifying with, empathizing with, having compassion for. And the third is actually to do something practical for others. The fact is we all have opportunities to proactively change other people's lives in large and small ways to the glory of God. That doesn't mean you have to start a nonprofit organization that feeds children in 20 countries. It can be a kind word, a word of encouragement, a word of compliment to someone who looks like they don't often get complimented. You know, I really appreciate your faithfulness in always being here for classes or for church or whatever. Um, a five peso coin, a car wash, whether you need it or not. Okay, I mean, I can't say yes all the time, right? I have my car washed five times a day. Right? But to do that, whether you need it or not, sometimes. To offer a meal or a job if you have work that can be done, um, a prayer, just to pray for somebody in the course of the day, to remember somebody's name. Um, the, the ladies that sit outside uh, super late, you all know what I mean? You know their names? No. Felicia is the, the one with gray hair. I confess I don't know the dark haired woman's name, but I've known Felicia a lot longer. And I, if I don't have any change, I say, Tengo no cambio, lo siento, Felicia, como esta? And she, oh, bien, bien, senor, you know. I used to do a lot of work with rescue missions. And people I know that are homeless, street people, have often said to me, and I've read this from others as well, that the thing that troubles them most about, you know, when they're asking for handouts or whatever, is not when somebody doesn't give them anything, it's when somebody doesn't even acknowledge that they're there. Invisible. That they're invisible. Mm -hmm. And they said, sometimes it means more for somebody to look at me and say, I'm sorry, I really don't have anything I can give you, but God bless you, you know, or just to say, 
how long have you been out here, or whatever, is huge. And we always find excuses for not doing something. But it's those little things, remembering a name, offering forgiveness, um, helping provide a scholarship, whatever else it is. There are a million practical things, sometimes just by things we say, by things we give, by things we do, <clears throat> including prayers for people, okay, bullet prayers, of seeing someone in need and, you know, and saying, Lord, bless that person. They don't know you, cause them to know you, but bless them in their lives. Sometimes for me, it's, I hope that person doesn't kill themselves driving that way before they get home, okay? But um, <laughs> the idea of praying for people um, as, we go, as we go through our lives, to act, and we can do more than we think we can do, including financial. All around us are people who are in need of love and of health and of healing, and sometimes the healing they need is just somebody remembering their name, or saying hello, or complimenting them, or greeting them. In our church, there's probably nothing more important to me than the fact that we have a lot of people who enjoy greeting everybody when they come in the door. I had, I had one, somebody say to me, in fact, somebody will recognize this, that when they went to the Baptist church, God bless them, I'm not picking on the Baptists, I'm not picking on any of the churches, but they walk in and there was one little old lady who had a little bullet and didn't say a word. And that was the greeting they received. And I shouldn't have said Baptist, because I'm really not picking on that church. We have such a tendency just to make assumptions about that sort of thing, when in fact, if we greet, and we hug, and we welcome, and we love, and we make an issue over how great it is that they're here, how much more does that mean to people? How much more value do they feel? I think it's very significant. I can tell you how significant it is, because I don't come to church very often, but when I do, I am recognized Rosie comes and reminds me she's Rosie, and she gives me hugs, and I say, I know you're Rosie, yeah. and I, I just love your hugs, so thank you. Rosie's great. From the door to my chair, I am acknowledged, not my presence, but, oh, we're so glad to see you, et cetera. Where have you been? What's been happening? Are you okay? Yeah. Genuine, concerned, caring, compassion for somebody they see in Right. And who theoretically has no meaning to it. And that doesn't cost us anything, but it makes a huge difference in people's lives. And so we it, also, it also communicates that the, it is most likely something that goes beyond these walls. Yeah. It and makes this place genuine. Yeah. You know, it's not that we are caring, loving the church, and it says so up there on the sign. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it yeah, we have a sign. What else do you want? <laughs> So we need to say, what are we doing about the fact that there are so many people in need of love and health and healing? What are we going to do about that in the name of Jesus? What acts are we able to do? And my introversion causes me not to do as, as much of that in terms of a pastoral kind of role as I, as I should. Okay. Um, one of the women who was in our session meeting one time, we were talking about getting an associate pastor because the programs are growing and, you know, the church and else. And she said, well, you know, when, when we get another pastor, can we get somebody who has different gifts than yours? You know, somebody who's compassionate. <laughs> she didn't mean it. She was not trying to be mean. What she was saying was that my nature, and I, I don't think people realize it, going to somebody's home that I don't know well, you know, if they're sick or they're missing from church or whatever, is like going to prison for me. I mean, it is, it's horrendous. Now, some people love that kind of stuff. And for me, it's a nightmare. Okay? <laughs> we are what we are. And yet, I feel the obligation that I need to overcome that more, and I'm going to commit myself to try to do that. Pardon? I was going to say just about the opposite, so that maybe means you should go with your strengths and let somebody else do that. And well, that's yeah, strength, that, you know? some of that is true. I mean, it's it's true that I think my strengths are this, you know, yes. teaching and preaching yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And so I don't want to deny, I don't want to not do my strengths in order to do my yeah, weakness. And yes, that makes a difference for people that, you know, the pastor didn't show up when I was sick. Yeah. I think it's an innate quality that women have more so than men because of our nurturing side. Yeah. Not that men don't have it, but it's more evident 
with us and we're more able to, to uh, show it particularly illness or, or, or particularly going into someone's home. That's, yeah. that's all that does. Yeah. You know, so you send Carolyn to visit. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's so good. Well, Carolyn's more like me in that regard. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm just saying that's an obvious. I, I think that's true. I mean, but there are men who, you're right, it's, there's no exact, it's person to person, but tend, it tends to be that women tend to be more comfortable in those situations. It's true. Just like, and that's why women are more likely to be involved in close social relationships with other women than men are. I mean, Men are, even if they have groups, they're always sort of at a, you know. Okay, so we must remember, we are not alone in all of this. These opportunities that God gives us to evangelize, to empathize, to act for others. And that when God gives us those opportunities, it's not we're not lone rangers. We may be adventurers, but we are there on assignment from the person who's ultimately in control of it, and we are not unprepared. Jesus said... And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We have both the assurance of Jesus of his presence with us and the reality of the Holy Spirit, the power of the third person of the Trinity in us, residing in us to empower us. And in terms of preparedness, Ephesians 6, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. What that means is, stand your ground, and even if you feel like you've gotten defeated, you're not going to be knocked down. Okay? Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. There's an opportunity there. The readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have been equipped. We have been outfitted with what we need to fight the battles that come when we take the risky opportunities that God puts on our paths. And so, time and opportunities.